Now, the, the three speakers are the brilliant minds. Leave me with very little room to ask questions already. But let me do a little bit. I learned from Lao Tzu, one of the ancient philosophers in history. So I would love to ask questions from two ends of the same question. First of all, short term versus long term. Every one of us here face that question. You talk about investment. Wonderful. But where's the money? Short term. What about the future? How do we know that? We love the directions you three gentlemen pointed uh, to all of us in the Asia Pacific, but we cannot guarantee the certainty of the future you described. So, what about short term, long term? Let's have, uh, let's go with this way, yeah? Is it okay this time? Uh, uh, Professor Schwab, uh, briefly. Short term, long term. Certainly, we have to think long term, and uh, as I mentioned, we have to think in strategic terms. This does not exclude to be very preoccupied with certain short-term issues. Uh, I'm thinking particularly, and here, by the way, this region has a great advantage with a higher um, macroeconomic stability in general compared to some of the European countries, um, because uh, fiscal policies are now very difficult to be um, adopted in order to uh, invest into the future, as you rightly said, we, we have squeezed out the national budget and the capabilities of government uh, facilitating um, investments into the future. So business has to come in, whatever you can, and um, uh, I, would, I would invest now as far as I can, and particularly invest into being at the top of the digital and green economy because this will pay the dividends in the future, being at the forefront of the digital and green economy. What about for a president of a country in the Asia Pacific, short term, long term? Well, very, uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will be specific to the Philippine experience. Short-term issues are very simple. It is actually, at this point, it is survival for many of our people, simply because uh, prices of fuel, prices of food has risen up to such an extent that they simply cannot afford to, uh, to, to survive without assistance from the government. And hence, we are still... Uh, uh, presently in the Philippines uh, providing just direct cash transfer payments. Uh, this, is not, this is not something that we prefer to do. I don't think that anyone is particularly enamored with direct cash transfer payments. But it is, it is the only way that we can mitigate the situation that our people have. So that is, uh, that is something that we are hoping with uh, the creation of jobs and with the growth of the economy to slowly begin uh, to dial down. And uh, it is with the pandemic beginning to ease, at least in our, in our, in our case, uh, then with a, there are, there's, a, there's a great deal of hope that that emergency situation will uh, slowly resolve itself uh, into some kind of normalcy. On the, in the long term, there really are, I agree with Mr. Moritz, the changes that need to be made are structural. They, they have to be done structurally because this is a different world, this is a different uh, 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 economy. And as we were discussing in the green room, he says, we're not playing catch up. And I said, even if you were, what are we trying to catch up to, 2019? I don't think that that's the plan. And so we have to be, uh, be, be, be we, we cannot be um, uh, too married to the ideas that we were holding as truths before and we have to be uh, willing to make big changes, but with recognition that uh, from what is actually happening around the world. But when we make these structural changes, I'd like to pick up on the point that Dr. Schwab made is innovation. We must allow still innovation to, uh, to, to we must still continue to encourage innovation and to recognize innovations that can actually help and immediately put them uh, mm -hmm. into, into play or send, uh, put that if it's a product to market or if it's a system uh, to implement that system. So the agility that Mr. Moritz is saying I think is the key 
to the future in the long term for not only the uh, ASEAN, uh, Asia Pacific region, Indo-Pacific region, but for the whole, uh, the whole world. Thank you, Mr. President. Short term, long term, Mr. Moritz. Let's be very clear for the politicians and the business leaders in the room. You actually need to survive the next two years to be able to thrive over the long term. And that requires you to deliver the trust and the outcomes and the immediacy to have the confidence and the trust of others to be willing to change for the long term. You need to deliver the results in the next two years to find the investment capacity to fuel the future. So as we think about this, it's a combination of two things. One is making sure you're delivering on the explicit needs in the short to enable the success in the long. Second is to describe and enable the journey. Right now, we talk about climate, for example, and Klaus's point and, and the president's points. It is not so black and white or binary to stop X and to move to Y. That'll be catastrophic to some economies and communities. It is the journey, a just and inclusive journey, that's going to be very important. And making sure that narrative is better understood by our stakeholders to better manage the short and long term is very, very important. Second question. What kind of state of the world are we in, and therefore the Asia-Pacific region? Is it being defined as, you know, at, I could use in many different languages to uh, describe the same thing or similar things, but in English it will be rivalry competition or cooperation, which we have seen in trade mechanisms at least uh, in the Asia Pacific region for decades. Maybe we start with Mr. President on that. As I, as, I, as I described, I think one of the great advantages that, the, uh, that APEC and uh, the uh, countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific region have been able to manage is that uh, very difficult balance between uh, cooperation and competition. And yet we seem, to, for the most part, I would say we have done it. And that is what has driven the growth of the region, is that we are able to compete with one another. But when we find opportunities where partnerships will be, will give the better result, we are all perfectly willing to enter into those partnerships as well. So that, I think, is going to be key. We, continue, we have done it before. It is the nature of APEC. If we continue to do that and strengthen that, I think it will be to the great benefit of all countries. Thank you. Professor? I think we should not underestimate the social pressures which make governments in principle today more egoistic because they have to serve their people first. But it's a responsibility despite this situation for business leaders and particularly for political leaders. And it is the helpfulness of organizations like APEC, like the World Economic Forum and so on, to remain the connectors on the global level. Because we never should forget, we are one humanity. And in the old ages, we had the village cooperations and we had national cooperation. Now we need global collaboration if we want to survive. Just look at climate change. Let me analogize to PwC. There's days where we compete fiercely with our competitors. There's days we come together to collaborate on societal opportunities. And we did so working with the World Economic Forum where the consulting and accounting firms came together to land a recommended set of metrics because the challenge was not business and a P&L, it was societal. Likewise, countries and companies need to do the same. The challenges we see today in COVID, it was one small example, albeit a challenging one, climate being the next, cannot be solved with competition in mind. And it does not limit itself to geographic borders or competitive landscapes. So it has to be compete when appropriate and collaborate as much as possible to the extent possible. And as we sit here today, we are starting to see more signs where the world is trying to take those on coming out of the G20 meetings or some of the other meetings that have been recently announced, and that hopefully gives us some more bright spot 
in the world of clouds that we see in front of us. And I'm sure the uh, fruitful results, shall I say, of the G20, particularly on the sidelines, many bilateral meetings, including be between the two world's largest economies, going to bring us a lot of opportunity for cooperation as well. Last question. Oh, my God. We only have 30 seconds left. Maybe we have one more minute uh, for our speakers. Just uh, very briefly, you all talk about building trust. It's not easy. Building trust or rebuilding trust. We know how difficult it is, especially over the past few years. We might not be able to see to each other in person. And I, we can see each other's shoes also, not just here through Zoom, right? So on that point, how that we can efficiently rebuild trust? Then I start with uh, Mr. Moritz. Yeah. Very quickly, but we're short on time. You need to engage and listen carefully. We have two ears and one mouth, twice as much listening, <laughs> maybe singular talking from our own point of view. And second, the world we have lived in in the last three years does not help. It creates more conflict or more risk of interpretation. We need to physically, as a human species, get back together again, socially and physically. I like that, human species, yes. Mr. President, please. Uh, in the political context, uh, the way to earn trust is to perform. Um, and uh, the best politics, I always say, the best politics is performance because it's something that cannot be taken away from you and it is something that actually makes a difference in people's lives. Walk the talk, perform. Perform, and uh, you, will, you will get the trust back of the people and uh, that is what we all, all politicians and I'm sure even, in, even people from the business side, that's what we strive for. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Schwab. Short answer. Microphone. To be I, Short answer to be trusted leaders. Now, what does it mean to be a leader and a trusted leader? You have to have brains, soul, heart, muscles, and good nerves. Let me explain. You have to be really professionals who look forward, strategists. See, um, so you have to have purpose. I think you get the trust if you show that you live up to a purpose. Finally, the heart, you have to do with passion what you are doing. And the muscles, you have to translate into action and walk the talk. And finally, as we say, we are in a crisis preparing for better times. We have to have good nerves. Thank you.